If you are looking to learn how to be a professional, successful comics creator and ready to do the things that it takes and learn the things that it takes to get to that point, then you have come to the right place because I am joined today by comics creator, professional, successful, incredible Dirk Manning. Now, normally, normally I would list off a bunch of books. I would list off the years. I would do all of that, but I'm not going to because in honor of the fact that we are talking about right or wrong, second edition, in honor of that fact, I want you, Dirk, to tell the audience, new listeners, right? People who don't know your story. Okay. Let them know about how you got here, why we're talking, the books that you're known for, all of that. Give them the the pitch. Oh my gosh. You, you, you've set me up. <laughs> you've teed me up and it's something huge. job. You wrote the book. No, there. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Hello. <laughs> and thank you for a, a wonderful introduction. Uh, Dirk Manning, writer, creator of uh, numerous comic books, mainly creator owned, celebrating my 20th anniversary as a published comic book writer. Uh, my first published comic book was Nightmare World. Um, it started as an online series, eventually got picked up by Image Comics, Shadowline, Devil's Dude, SourcePoint Press now has the complete collection coming out. Again, 20 years later, the book is still in print. Um, but as you said, I'm a comic book writer, you know, um, I've been doing this for 20 years. Books people may know me for include the aforementioned Nightmare World, uh, Tales of Mystery, The Adventures of Cthulhu Jr. and Friends, Hope, Butts and Seats, the Tony Schiavone story with, um, Tony Giovanni from All Elite Wrestling. Um, I write Twisted Haunted High Ons, which has been nominated for a total of four Ringo Awards. Uh, I wrote the original graphic novel, Buried But Not Dead, which was nominated for Best Original Graphic Novel in the Ringo Awards. Uh, just finished up a Kickstarter campaign recently with Arn Anderson, the professional wrestler. Uh, we recently announced that I'm doing a graphic novel adaptation of the lost horror classic London After Midnight with Cheney Entertainment, uh, Lon Cheney's uh, estate. Uh, those of you that don't know the name London After Midnight, I promise you, if you Google it, the image of the guy with the top hat and the fangs and the big eyes will come <laughs> up. You'll know exactly it. So I'm going to do the graphic novel adaptation of that. Um, another really major horror thing that I can't announce yet but we will be announcing soon. And uh, yeah, and I guess we're here to talk about Right or Wrong, A Writer's Guide to Creating Comics. Uh, this started as a online column back in the day uh, at newsrama.com, eventually moved over to Bleeding Cool. And then uh, after that came out as a book through Caliber Comics, Right or Wrong, Writer's Guide to Creating Comics. Um, and we are now have on Kickstarter, it'd go to Right or Wrong book. Dot com, right or wrong book.com or type in right or wrong into Kickstarter. We are doing a newly revised, updated second edition of the book, which is my, uh, I, I kind of joke around that it's half inspirational, half instructional, half entertaining. Just, I'm not very good at math. But, <laughs> Steiner math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steiner math about, uh, or Steiner math, yeah. Yeah. Um, about, uh, touche about um about writing comics and about following your dreams to be a, a professional creative now the reason why i asked you to do that is so that the listener knows that everything that you're going to read in that book everything that you're going to hear today is coming from a person who has really actually done it and has done it over decades and yeah. has done it successfully in multiple forms that's key because a lot of people give advice, right? Advice oh, is yeah, free. Yeah, that's true. Right, a right. lot of times advice is free and it's not necessarily coming from people who have the pedigree, right? Well-intentioned, but sometimes it's not coming from a person who has the pedigree. And so when we say, right, that right or wrong is a book that can help you become a professional creator in comics, we know that it's that be that's being said by someone who's really done it. I emphasize professional creator, by the way, because I feel as I, I found this book uh, through the through the, the the columns. I love the column, right? And I want wanted and want to be a professionally published writer. 
But I don't think this is just for writers. I think you can read this if you're an artist of any kind. Mm -hmm. I think you might even benefit from this if you're an editor, because you need to know the way that it's done professionally in comics. You know, I appreciate you saying that. Um, my editor on this book, Lee Letterman, who now is a multi-time published author as well, she gave what I consider to be one of the biggest compliments to right or wrong the book ever. Uh, I brought her in to edit the book. And when she got done editing the whole book, the original version of the book is about 215 pages. The new edition that's on Kickstarter right now at writerwrongbook.com is about uh, 260 pages. So it's about 30% more newly uh, revised updated content. But anyway, when she edited the original version of the book, I said to her, I said, Leah, you just edited a 215 page book about writing for comics. And it's all about comic books and writing for comics and following that, that path. And I said, honestly, friend to friend, how miserable was it? Because <laughs> she's not, she was not in the comic books at all, which is one of the reasons I wanted her to edit the book, right? You know, I wanted someone who doesn't read comics, you know, and, and myself, I'm not even necessarily a traditional comic book uh, reader, I think, in some ways. I love comics, but I, I didn't. As you're reading the book, I, I didn't even start reading comics when I was a teenager, right? I wasn't like that kid that grew up with superhero stuff. But anyway, I digress. I digress. How miserable was this to read 215 pages about comic books? <laughs> and she said to me, she goes, Dirk, I'm going to tell you this as your editor. I'm going to tell you this as a friend. She goes, this book helped me so much. She goes, realizing what I need to do to fulfill my creative ambitions and what it takes to follow through on that. She goes, and you gave so much advice. And it's so funny that you, you two, I don't think you've met. She said exactly what you said. She goes, right or wrong is a book that can help anybody following create their creative endeavors and their creative dreams. And I was like the Grinch, like my heart, you know, swelled three sizes, you know, too big at that moment because right or wrong is my pay it forward book. You know, um, I mentioned a minute ago, this is my 20th year as a published comic book creator. And I've done about 20 creator own or 20 graphic novels worth of work, mostly creator owned, not all. I don't own Twisted. I don't own Tony Schiavone. I don't own Arn Anderson, you know, but I've done 20, about 20 graphic novels in 20 years, right? I'm very, very dedicated to this. And I've done, I, I, I was one of the pioneers of online comics. I was one of the trendsetters with crowdfunding comic books and things like that. And I've worked with Image Comics. I've left Image Comics. You know, I, I, you know, I've, I've, done, I've worked with small publishers. I've done, I've done all this stuff. But I always said, if I get to, from day one, I said, if I get to a point when I am making comics, I will do everything I can to help other people make comics you know i was once that guy that would go to comic con and sit in panels and listen to your, your joe casadas and your mark waves and all these people and and and, and, and talk to people I, I talk in right or wrong about you know before i had written my first book going up to brian michael bendis at a convention and they said you are doing what i want to do i know i can write i i know i have enough talent to do this and, and i don't mean that in a cocky way but i i, I guess 20 years yeah. later proven true but i said I, I know i have the capacity but i don't know the way right i've been that person and i've never lost that in my heart i've never lost that in my mind you know so so right or wrong it's my pay it forward project you know um so you you saying to what to me now what my editor said to me years ago when i did the first edition that that means a lot to me thank you that means that i i've done something right because i i just want to help people build up to pursue their their creative endeavors in a way that'll help them be successful there's no one way right right or wrong is my way but but hopefully there's enough in the book that's applicable to any journey moving forward yeah and i and i think the book you know you you do a a, a job in the book of saying hey listen this is the way that i did it um these are the things that work for me they may not be the things that work for you but right there are certain things and 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 that's why it's so important to say like if you're a creator, you know, this is the kind of thing that you need to to read because 
there are certain things that are consistently true, right? Right. Like a lot of times, if you go on social media, you might see somebody uh, talking about a writer talking about their artist or, you know, something of that nature. We talk about artist abuse and artists being mistreated and things like that. Right. 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 And it's going to be really hard to make it in comics if you treat your artist poorly. Right. That that you that's pretty much going to be a universal fact. Like maybe you've got the kind of money where you can treat anybody however you want to treat them and they're going to do work for you. But if you're not that person, if you're coming from the ground up and, you know, you need to treat people well, you know, and even if you have that kind of thank money, you, that's you still have uh, you saw it. You well. saw me like champion of the bit. You, even if you have that kind of money, you don't do that. Right. Right. It's there's a whole yeah. there's a whole chapter in the book called They're Not Robots. It talks about that. It talks about the fact that, hey, our, like again, I wrote this book as a writer. I cannot even draw a crooked line, right? <laughs> I, I was a really good artist in first grade. I never got any better. I mean, that, that's me. That's my, my artistic capacity. Um, artists, illustrators, they also are getting into this line of work and they may be willing to work with you to further their own careers, right? And yeah, uh, someone like Mary Pascosta or Josh Ross or Austin McKinley or or Len O'Grady or any number of these artists who, uh, uh, Les Garner, Sally Scott, you name it. Any of these artists I I currently work with or I've worked with for years, they're not my artist. They're an artist I work with, but you're right. So that's one of those biggest things I talk about in the book is like, the dynamic of that relationship and you have to right. be very well aware of that and you have to honor that and, and and that starts in how we talk how we talk internally and how we how we communicate externally to others it's very important to be aware of that stuff so i'm, I'm, I'm glad that's something that you picked up on and and you know what uh, I'll, I'll turn it on myself a little bit real quick because when i first approached an artist to work with mm-hmm. around 2009 2010 okay. um I was already reading your column. Uh, And so I applied some of the same sorts of ideas to the conversations that I was having with this person. Now, this is an individual that I met, not, uh, I I didn't meet them because of what we were both trying to do. I met them just through a mutual friend, but I still knew that in order to make a, good relationship with them and get work out of them and, and and do something cool together. You know, I had to approach them professionally. Yes. I didn't have money, but I had the ability to treat them like a human, the way I would want to be treated. And right. that made them want to work with me. And we ended up doing, doing cool stuff together, you know? Right. Um, right. And that's what it's about. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You know, uh, I get it. And it's funny, you know, we talk about the money thing. I talk very candidly and very openly. I tell the story in the book about how uh, I weaseled my way into a meeting with Axel Alonso, who at the time was uh, an editor for Vertigo over at DC Comics. And that was like the vein of stuff I wanted to do, right? I'm mainly a horror writer. And I wanted to do like something that like Vertigo would publish one day. Vertigo, RIP. Hmm. Moment of silence for Vertigo. So... And he told me, and I'll give you a little preview of what's in the book. He he told me, he goes, well, I can't read your scripts, but if you make a comic, he said, I'll read it. He goes, I love comics. And if you, if you can give me some comic pages, self-publish a little comic, even a little, something small, he goes, I can read that. We can talk. And I told him, I said, I would love to do that, but I don't have money to pay an artist. And I'm not going to give away the punchline, but he, what he told me in that moment, which I detail very directly in right or wrong, the new second edition, <laughs> source my press, it changed my whole perspective on everything. And it was at that moment, literally, he told me what he told me, which is in the book. I, I looked at him and I said, thank you. I said, I get it. I said, thank you. You know, and, and it caused me, like you were talking about, to completely realign how I was approaching doing all of this stuff. And it was it was a short time later that I was able to launch Nightmare World as an online comic book series. 
And that's the, the, that book became the foundation of my whole career. You know, I, I, I still, every convention I have ever done, I'm fairly sure this is an accurate statement. For 20 years, every convention I've done, I've sold at least one copy of my work. You know, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? But that's the book that, that launched my career. It was because of that conversation, but because of recognizing obviously how you treat people is a big part of it, but also just recognizing how how the rules of engagement, how, how you have to interface with this in a professional capacity. You know, making a making a living in in anything creative is difficult. And and a lot of people they do this as a side job. Yeah. You know. Uh, being a comic book artist or writer oftentimes doesn't provide you health insurance, for example, or steady income, or when the market turns upside down, or when a global pandemic happens and shuts down distribution and shuts down conventions. You know, we've we've been through this. So, yeah, I, I uh, there, there's a lot to it, and that's a lot of the stuff I talk about in the book. Sorry, I, I can go on about this all day. I'm very passionate about it. So, of course, absolutely. Um, and as am I, and and or as are the people that I would imagine want to hear this kind of conversation. Um, and so one of the things that you talk about in the book. And this is a point that, again, a lot of writers don't know, don't understand. This is a simple rule and a fact. It will cost you money. Yes. To do this job. Yes. Right. And I'm going I'm to oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm gonna I was this. just going to I was going to say this is this is something that a lot of people don't understand, don't take into account. Being a writer in comics is a grind and it is a costly grind. And you detail that expertly with your own experience. You provide a lot of useful resources as well. Uh, if you need, if you need to know these things, it's all in the book. Yeah. And, and you, again, we talk about language being important, right? I tell people it's not that it costs money. It's that, you need to invest money in this, right. right? You need to invest in it. And you do realize, and, and, and again, and I realize some people, don't matter when you don't have money, it doesn't matter if it says you cost, you spend, you invest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, not talk, I'm not talking, you know, sitting on a pile of $100 bills and, oh, well, you just invest your money like the nouveau rich. No, <laughs> but what you're doing is you're investing in your career. And that's one of the things that Axel talked to me about back in the day was he's like, is it that you don't have money? Or is it how you're spending the money you have, right? I'm sitting to you on video in a room. I've got Funkos and surrounded by a library of books that I've amassed over over a lifetime. I, I got very few of the things in this office for free, right? But sometimes you do need to just spend money on, I don't know, gelatinous cube. <laughs> you know, because it it brings me joy this right. little 12 dollar piece of plastic every time i look at it i laugh you know just it's like oh my gosh the gelatinous cube you know and things like that but to your point you're exactly right i mean you do have to allocate money to this career and you might make it back quickly you might make it back just in books or you might lose it there's things i've done where i've I poured money into something and not gotten it back. Sometimes all you get out of it's a book. Sometimes all you get out of it's the experience. But that's all part of the journey. Right. Right. And that's what I want to do with right or wrong is talk about that journey. I'm very open in the book about things I've done right, but also things I've done wrong. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of missteps I made. There's a whole chapter in the book called Things Fall Apart. You know, then later in the book, there's things fall apart again. <laughs> you know. Uh, I have not always fallen upward. I, I you know, I, I've had uh, my own situations where life circumstances happen. Again, I talk about in the book about um, I was living in a residence at one point that literally started falling apart around me right when I was trying to launch my career. What do you do? It's like, oh, am I going to spend money on an artist or am I going to fix these floorboards so I don't fall through into the sub-basement and die? Right. <laughs> right. Then I'm, then I'm like living like my own horror story, right? Or when you 
screw up having, you know, interactions with an artist and, and, and you don't, you know, interface properly. You know, people always talk about uh, artists ghosting out. I, I inadvertently ghosted out. Uh, I, I, as a writer, inadvertently ghosted out early in my career on someone making that right and, and doing that, you know. So I think it's important. I think it's important for someone to take the time to talk about this stuff, right? A lot of times people will see, well, Dirk Manning, he's got, you know, 20, 20 graphic novels out. And he just, you know, must have poured all this money into it. I like the word you use, Sean. I've grinded. Ground? Grinded, ground, whatever. I don't know. I, You've been on the grind. I've been on the grind. There we go. I like it. Well played. Uh, I've been on here. Like, me, a writer. Me don't work good. <laughs> I, I, but I've been on that grind. And, uh, you know, it's like Dusty Rhodes. What is it? You know, I've winded down the kings and queens. I've slept on the ground and ate franks and beans or whatever, you know. Yeah. A little bit of everything, you know. So, but it goes back to that initial promise I made to myself. I said, if I ever get to the point where I'm making comics, I'll do everything I can to help other people. And when the original version, which I know I've been flashing it here on the video a few times, it got to a point where this original version of Right or Wrong, I still stand by this book. If people have this original version, I stand by it. But technology has advanced and a lot of things have evolved and things like that. So the new edition, the second edition of this book, which is on Kickstarter, it follows the exact same chapters. The chapters in the book are exactly the same. I did add a new forward and a new um, new epilogue to the book, which I, I, I talk about some of the epilogue that I, I didn't really discuss publicly before about what was going on during the creation of this book. But uh, I've added about 30% new content. I've updated stuff. I've updated some of the technology stuff and just, you know, having a couple more years under my belt, I've been able to, to I don't think I really said anything going through the original version of this book that I disagree with, mm -hmm. but I can expound upon some things. I can add on something. I can add some additional context because like you said, this book is literally most verbatim based on the columns I was writing for Newsarama as I was going through it, as I was publishing Nightmare World Online. Now I've had multiple publishing contracts behind me. I've had books out, Kickstarters, things like that. So again, paying it forward, I wanted to do a new edition of this book that would give people still what I could truly say with a straight face, timeless advice. Absolutely. You know, so Absolutely. I completely agree. And I think that even though the landscape of comics creation has changed from certainly from when you first um published the book uh the the initial volume of right and wrong but even if you go back further to where night where nightmare world first started you know this is all pre-kickstarter oh um, yeah this is pre you know social media dominance really right, right. this is right. a different era that we're talking about but the thing is that all the advice still applies it applies even if you go back into the 90s it applies if you go yeah. back into the 80s because these are mm -hmm. just these are just the classic rules and the tools that you can use to uh, to become a professional comics creator. Now, the other thing I wanted to say that I think is interesting is that there are people who they'll see this book. They love Dirk Manning. They love, you know, Nightmare World. They love Tales of Mystery. But they'll see this and say, well, this isn't for me. Right. right. This isn't for me because I'm not a creator. I, I don't aspire to that. But the cool thing is that while, yes, this book is certainly aimed at creators. It it also has another element of being sort of a uh, like a like a biography of your of your life, yeah. and I, I really I really appreciate that part of it as well. Where you know, as a fan of you, right, as a, as somebody who you know enjoyed who you are, or at least the version of you that I knew at the time when I first read the book. Right. Um, it was cool to get to peel the layers back and see, you know, the real struggles and the trials and tribulations and how you got your start and things like that. So I'm saying that to say, I think even if you don't necessarily aspire to write, um, it's cool to actually learn more about the man behind the mask, if you will. Yeah, literally. Right. Thank you. And, and that's the thing too. I, um, I've always walked this fine line between trying to be very accessible, but, at my core, I'm a, and people watching this may laugh, 
I'm a very private introverted person. Mm. I, I really am. But I also recognize that I'm very passionate about what I do. And I, no one will sell your books like you will. That's one of the things we talk about in the book is like, you have to believe in yourself and as self-depreciating as a person I can be sometime. I can, I'm looking right now, right up to the side here, I have a spinner rack, almost totally full of all my graphic novels. My goal is to fill that spinner rack over there. It's an old timey spinner rack. And I want to That's fill cool. it. Not with single issues, not like issue one, two, three, no, no, no. Graphic novel, graphic novel, graphic novel. There's no cheating that way. And <laughs> I, 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 I like to let the work speak for itself. But again, it comes back to that thing in me about, and sometimes you see memes or quotes about this, you know, be who you needed someone to be for you when you were younger, right? Yeah. And, and the older I've gotten and more reflection I've done and, and things like that, I've realized how much that has defined a lot of my my life. but to do that, I did find, and it's funny, and, and I'll tell you, to, to a point of this, and by the way, for people out there watching this or listening to this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on blast for a second, Sean. Okay. I don't think you know what I'm about to tell you. Oh, wow. It's about you. I don't think you know what I'm about to tell you about you. <laughs> Outside of the creative team, you are the first person to read any of the second edition of Right or Wrong. Wow. Or at least have access to it. I should say, I don't know if you read it all. No, no I did. I, I did. I read, okay, okay. I read what you sent me. Yeah. 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 So those two chapters I sent you, no one outside of the creative team has read any of that but you. Wow. Well, I feel honored. Well, that's incredible. Comic pals are longtime pals of Dirk Manning, and, and you especially have always been a very good friend, personally, professionally. So that was my, my, my gift to you. But I say that to say this, and I don't remember if this was in the chapters I sent you or not. Going through the book, the original version of the book, when you when you read it, whenever there's a photo of me, I would like Photoshop, like the, <laughs> the, the, the hat and the scarf on there and stuff like that. And um, I haven't put the files to print yet, but I, you can see here, I got to hit you my voice when I say this. I kind of decided it's like, it's okay to put your face on it, Dirk. You know, like the public publicity photo of Dirk Manning is always this. Yeah. And for years, I've thought about changing it. People have urged me to change it. But it's kind of like, not that I'm the gold, not that I'm McDonald's, but that's kind of like the Golden Arches. That's like my brand. Yeah, right? that's, that's cool. That's, that's cool. It's, that, that's, 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 that's how I'm comfortable presenting forward as a, as a person that really at heart's pretty introverted. But when I was going through the book and there's uh, pictures of me with Jim Valentino my first time at San Diego Comic-Con or pictures of me with Mike Patton and uh, uh, Chuck Mosley, who are singers of my favorite, one of my favorite bands, Faith No More, if not my favorite band. And I thought about it and I'm like, when I first published the book, I would, I would again, like we would Photoshop on glasses and a scarf and a hat, but I'm like, I don't want to give a copy of this book to Jim Valentino and have him look at our picture <laughs> <laughs> he would call me up and he would email me he'd be like the hell's wrong with you man get over yourself get over it but i've never been a person comfortable in photos and i've never been a person that i never wanted it to be about me i want it to be about the work but especially with something like right or wrong i am the work right that this is it and and I had to kind of force myself to be vulnerable about that and say, no, here, here's a picture no one's ever seen. This is me and Jim Valentino, my first time, my first time ever at San Diego Comic-Con. Or here's a photo of me presenting at the Diamond Retailer Summit in 2020, right before the whole world turned upside down. Or here's a picture of me before I was writing comics, when I was doing music journalism with Mike Patton and not, not, superimposing a, a fake <laughs> hat and scarf on there so which is a very long way of saying yes um my hope is that even if people don't want to create comics they'll find the story interesting i've had a very interesting story and it's filled with some pretty big successes and it's filled with some pretty big failures and uh 
a book that's always been very important to me over the years that I've, I've enjoyed is things like Zen and the Air Motorcycle Maintenance, um, which is a, a classic book. And, and, I, and I like reading books like that. And I, and I personally like reading books about people that, I guess I'm dumb, but again, I, I, I'm one day into a Kickstarter campaign and I'm, I'm fried. I, <laughs> I, I, like, I like reading books about people who I find interesting. When you look at Stephen King's book on writing, yes, I, I never, fun fact, I have yet to finish that book hmm. because I didn't want to influence right or wrong. Okay, that makes, right, that, make, that makes <laughs> you sense. know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to write on writing light. It's like when I was writing Nightmare World, I never went back and I, I read Flinch back in the day, the old Vertigo comic, or obviously I love the Twilight Zone. Yeah, the whole time I was writing Nightmare World for those years. I never allowed myself to watch Twilight Zone episodes. I didn't go back and reread Flinch. Doing right or wrong, I never read Stephen King's on writing. And then when I got the book done, I was able to start reading. Like, ah, okay, okay, it's now I can do this. But uh, you know, it's like that. It's it's yeah. The book. I, I hope people find it entertaining and, and inspirational. And I've, I've led a a wild, crazy life up to 2020, which is when I capped volume one of the book, and then the rest will be. When I do the second volume, yes, which I can't wait for. I'm very, very excited about that as well. Um, I said you, to you before it's going to be a pipe bomb when it comes out, man. So, well, we need it. We definitely need it. Um, but you know, yeah. you mentioned that you shared with me uh, some chapters from the second edition of Right or Wrong, which is up on Kickstarter right now, and by the way, is funded, which is amazing. Congratulations on that, and we Thank will you. talk about uh you know the next steps we will talk about the stretch goals here in a moment yeah, we funded um, in under two hours which was pretty wild beautiful that's beautiful but the the pages that you that you shared with me you know you you joked about being self-deprecating um you know hopefully you don't mind me sharing this nope you no said, go ahead i put you on blast so <laughs> come at said, me bro <laughs> you, you said to me uh oh hope you don't hate them yeah, you know, hope yeah. you don't hit the pages. And <laughs> obviously, I'm not going to hate the pages, Dirk. I like the original book. Obviously, yeah. I'm going to like the updated second edition. They're fantastic. And, okay. you know, the things that you're saying here are, are as relevant um, as they've ever been. And I love that about it. Uh, I love the fact that you, you, you give actionable tips and advice, things that a person who is thinking about making a comic might be wrestling with, and they don't know the mm -hmm. right answer to. So can we go over a couple of things yeah, that you man. talk about? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, awesome. totally, totally. Awesome. So one of the things, one of the things that you talk about mm -hmm. um, is you, you don't have to make a comic book that's in color. Now, the reason why I go to that is because American comics are color dominant right like in america westernized comics most of them are in color and so when someone goes to make a comic they just assume it's going to be in color it's going to have inks it's going to have letters those are all going to be different people and it's going right. to be great and then when you sit down and you have to think about the reality of that mm -hmm. factors like money start to play into it right mm -hmm. and so you talk about you know there are ways that you can get around the gargantuan costs or investment, as you put it earlier, into your comics. So why did you single out coloring? And can you talk a little bit about your perspective on, on you know, adding coloring to your comics? Yeah. I, I joke around that when I did Nightmare World, I didn't follow my own advice, and I did my horror anthology in color. Right? <laughs> but I also, as I talk about in the book, was part of a studio where there were colorists who were looking for... Um, outlets where they could demonstrate what they do. And, and I created the original version of Nightmare World as like an online portfolio for all of us in a way. But the reason I tell people that, especially aspiring creators, you don't have to do a book in color. There's a couple of reasons. One, coloring adds cost to your page count. Two, a bad colorist can mar good line work. And three, with limited exceptions, you will never wait longer than you wait on colors for a book. And I'm not saying that to slam colorists, but coloring takes at least as much time as illustrating. And in fact, 
the more detailed the art is, the more detailed the colors usually have to be. There are people out there who are color snobs, right? And in, in regards to, they will not read a black and white comic. But I talk about it in the book, and I think I talked about the section you read, when you look at some of the most successful and influential American comics, The Walking Dead, Bone, Sin City, Strangers in Paradise. Well, you can go on and on and on. You know, you look at books like Cerebus, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Right. Black and white. They started in black and white. And what's so crucial as a creator when you're getting started is getting the book out. And why put extra obstacles in your way, whether they be financial obstacles, obstacles of time, you know, get the book out, man. If you get to the point where you can write a script and you can get it illustrated and then you can get it lettered, put it out. Jeff Smith went back later and got Scholastic to pay to color his series. Wow. That's the way you do it, right? That's the way you do it. And I have more copies. Bone is one of the books I have the most copies of, of anything. But he has like a black and white omnibus. And then when Scholastic did, they did a color omnibus, you know? Don't, as an aspiring creator, don't put extra obstacles in your way. Will you potentially lose a few readers because, oh, this is black and white, I'm not reading it? Yeah, maybe. But you know what? I would rather have a book out that one out of 10 people won't read because it's not in color than a than no book out that zero out of 10 people can read. That's a phenomenal point. And if I can expound on that, it, it ties into something that you said earlier. And this is something that I also learned from writer. Steiner Ron math? Initially. <laughs> no, not Steiner math. But it's that, you know, an editor, a publisher, these are really yeah. the people that you're courting with that earlier stuff obviously you want to build a fan base mm -hmm. but if if your goal is to work for you know image or and, and take your pick it could be a smaller publisher like vault who do great stuff it could be anybody right source point press who's publishing source point paper. press absolutely source point press does phenomenal stuff if it's any of them the only way you're going to get in is if you have work done already mm -hmm. or you're famous for doing something else. So you might be like Tom King, who wrote a novel before he started in comics. Mm -hmm. That's his in, right? Mm -hmm. Scott Snyder, I believe, came from literature. So these creators were great at something else. They had something to show. And that opened the door. Right now, yes. right now Marvel loves writers from everything other than comics. More than ever. That's me saying. <laughs> this is something that we talked about on the show. Right, right, right. I know. I'm laughing. You talked about <laughs> so, so either you're going to be that guy, right? And that's a whole other career path, which, by the way, a lot of the principles in right or wrong still apply. But you're either going to be that guy or you're going to be the guy who has to come in from the ground floor. And having something to show is literally the most important thing that you can have when it comes to approaching an editor or someone important at a publisher. Right. Because the thing is, what editors want to see more than anything, and I'm not talking about freelance editors who will just edit your scripts and things like that. I'm talking sure. about editors that are in a position to make decisions to publish work at a publisher. That editor, which is weird because they have the same title, but they want to see, can you do the thing? And then how well can you do the thing? And sometimes, I'll tell you another fun fact, sometimes it's not even about how well you can do the thing, it's just can you do the thing at all? I mean, a little sneak peek here of Right or Wrong Volume 2. And I, maybe I touch on this in the second edition of Volume 1, I'm not sure. Because actually, it's funny, I reread Volume 1 and I was preparing to write Volume 2, so sometimes things blur. Right. But this is, a, if not, there's a Comics Pals exclusive. In okay. comics, especially, there's three qualities people are looking for. They want you to be good. They want you to be fast. They want you to be nice. Now, here's the kicker, Sean. It's a three-legged stool, and you only need to have two of them. Mm. Right? Let's play this out. You can be good and fast, then you don't have to be nice. You can be nice and fast. You don't have to be good. 
I mean, seriously, when you feel about this way, what would I leave out? You can be nice and uh, good. Yeah, right. But then you don't have to be fast. Mm-hmm. That's what people are looking for. But all of those things are contingent on getting a product out to show people. If I look at this, if I if people show me uh, art samples, you know, the first thing I always ask them is how long did it take you to do this? And I said, honestly, and sometimes people say it took me a week. Sometimes people say it took me two hours. Like, okay, we can have that conversation either way because you've done the thing. Don't worry about colors. Don't even worry about putting it in print per se. Just if you do print, and I talk about this in the book, if you do print on demand and just make 10 copies of it to give to editors, to give to publishers, to give for submit, you know, most submission guidelines, even then doesn't want a book, you know? I mean, but just to stay to the point of your question with color, don't put something extra in your way. Now, if the book absolutely positively needs color to work and you are not able to sleep at night, And the only way that you will know if this truly succeeded or failed is on the merit of whether or not it was colored. Do what you gotta do. That's what I did with Nightmare World. I I just had to be colored. But ironically, my second series, Tales of Mystery, first volume, black and white. Love it. Grayscale. Right. Now, again, when we went back, we eventually did a full color with the omnibus. But that was 15 plus years later. About 15 years later don't put obstacles in your way just get the product out so anything better than perfect finished and that and that's a gem that i think applies really to almost any job you can have especially mm-hmm. if you're talking about a creative endeavor mm-hmm. um that is just a key it is absolutely a key and you know again that's the kind of stuff that you're getting um from from picking up this book from picking up right or wrong uh, from picking up the uh, the uh, the second edition, I want to go over one more point sure. if we can. Yeah, at rightorwrongbook.com or right or wrong on Kickstarter. There you go. Uh, so you talk about an online presence. Mm-hmm. And I think this is really interesting because in today's age, especially, people ha- are used to having more access to the creators, the entertainers that they love than ever before. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost as much about how they feel about you as it is about how they feel about your work. Yes. So having a a presence online is super important. I see a lot of creators anecdotally that don't really have such great presences, especially those that are on the rise. And it reflects in the engagement that they get on social. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and it's funny. This is something I actually know for a fact. I talk about a lot more in volume two, but but I will tell you for the sake of this interview. And, and again, and we touch. I touch in volume one about building an online presence and building a brand for yourself. When I say to you out there listening to this right now, and and, and to you as well, Sean, I'm going to play a little game here to prove my point. Okay, I'm going to say something. I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to name a couple creators. Okay. Grant Morrison. Okay. Alan Moore. Okay. Warren Ellis. Okay. Mark Miller. Okay. Garth Ennis. Okay. Murderer's Row. Murderer's Row. British Talent. When I said Grant Morrison, did you get a picture of him in your mind? 100% 100% I did, yeah. Okay. What about Alan Moore? Mm-hmm. You get a picture of him in your mind when I said it? Absolutely. What about Warren Ellis? 150%. What about Garth Ennis? You know what? Yes, but that's because I've actually interviewed Garth, so I might be a bad... Right. Uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. What about Mark Miller? Yeah. The reason I bring this stuff up, those creators, now Garth, not not so much Garth. Garth's brand has just been what he does. He's actually kind of social media person for the most part. But Alan Moore and Morrison and all these guys, 
crafted an image for themselves and they made themselves the brand, right? I think when you think about people like Dan Slott, who, who's an amazing comic book writer, he really, part of his brand for a long time became, he's a Spider-Man guy. And I think there was a little bit of a disconnect then when he went to go do something like Silver Surfer. And he had to kind of punch up a little bit to get, you know, swim upstream on that. He goes, oh, well, now the Spider-Man guy's doing something else. I think it's, and, and, and that's, I'm not disparaging Dan Slott at all. He's an right. amazing writer. His run on Spider-Man is untouchable. His stuff on Silver Surfer with Aldred, uh, uh, Mike Aldred is incredible. Okay. But there's a difference between building your brand as yourself versus building your brand as the guy that worked on a certain character, right? I think it's crucial that as a creator coming up with social media, that you recognize what is that brand you're building for yourself as a creator, right? It's, it's crucial. And again, the dynamics of social media are so powerful now and the dynamics of the expectations of people on social media and the dissemination of information and disinformation on social media is, is these are all factors. And it's so funny because again, I talk about this a lot more in Right Around Volume 2. But I think it's crucial that you recognize, you know, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 just came out and, and I watched the movie and I enjoyed it. But I also couldn't help but view it through the lens of he was fired mm. by Marvel. And then they kind of had to hand, hand bring him back to finish it over, what was it a tweet from like years ago? Yeah, yep. That's the world we live in now. A decades old tweet taken, whether it be taken in context or not, or whether it even is reflective of who you are as a person now or not could be leveraged against you so someone else can get your spot right and oftentimes that's what it comes down to is that people for whatever reason it, whether they have a personal axe to grind a professional axe to grind they think that getting you out of the way will help their career or or whether it's that presidential assassination mentality people that try to assassinate other powerful people they oftentimes find it's not that like the guy that went to shoot Reagan didn't shoot Reagan because he hated Reagan. He wants to be associated with Ronald Reagan forever. Right. There's that, that association mentality. And if I can't get your attention in a good way, I'll get your attention. Man, right. All this stuff. So it's very important as an aspiring creator to recognize how you build your brand and how you build your image. It comes back to what we talked about earlier. I've never been a guy comfortable being on camera. Uh, I've never been a guy that's been, you know, comfortable being on video, you know? Uh, so when I created the, the, started building my brand as a creator, I went to this, this image right here, the guy at the top of the scarf, which by the way, we haven't touched on it yet, but you can actually get these limited edition real life Dirk Manning toy figures at rightorwrongbook.com, made by Knucklehead Toys. I'm in a toy line with Guar, <laughs> with Cheech and Chong, with Twisted, with Ming Cheng, and Dirk Manning. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Jelly Roll, he's in the line. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah, building that brand and, and just recognizing that how you how you interface with other people, but also just that outward communication you put forward. It's very important, you know, it's very important. A guy like, I mentioned a guy like Garth Ennis, he doesn't do a lot on social media. He just goes and does his work. Alan Moore looks like Alan Moore as part of his image. That's his brand, right? Right. It is not a coincidence that he's this big, hairy wizard. <laughs> not, he'll tell you, and the rings and everything else. And Grant Morrison will tell you that it is not a coincidence. The one, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this, Sean, I apologize. Neil Gaiman. Yeah. He's another one. How many years was it that Neil Gaiman would wear sunglasses and a leather jacket at all times? Right. Right. You can tell I have Kickstarter brain. I apologize. It's like it's like baby brain for people have newborns. Right. <laughs> These are people that blatantly quaffed their quaffed their image. 
to be part of the brand. So that's something I think about. I talk about this in, in volume one as well. Be aware. You can't help it if people are going to try to drag you. You can't help it if people are going to troll you. And you can't take back something stupid you said or did. But what you can do is be cognizant of it. And then just do your best to operate in a way that uh, was, I saw, I saw a little quote the other day. It was funny. Uh, Dance like no one is watching text and email. Like it could someday be read in court. Yeah. 100. (laughs) That is definitely the way of the world now. That's how you have to, you know, but, but yeah, you you do need to be cognizant. And that is something I talked about in volume one of right or wrong. And then we're going to get into that a lot more in volume two, but uh, yeah, MySpace made my career, Sean. MySpace made my career. Wow using social media to promote nightmare world to horror fans not comic fans to horror fans made my career and that's that's a a very big part of this so if you are an aspiring creator listening to this uh maybe you have a personal account and a pub and a public i I don't know i mean there's different ways to interface with that how you want to do it but your point is very well taken you need to be very very cognizant of that and and build your brand and then for me for better for worse this is my brand now okay top <laughs> of it, you know uh people i've had publishers even kind of dog me about it like when are you going to change that and i'm like i get it it, st- it still makes me laugh every time i look at it <laughs> well i love it and it's it's something yeah. that makes you identifiable you know and i know that as far as like just even having a podcast you have to have a logo you have to have a branding you have to have something that people know you for right and i didn't want my brand to be nightmare world i love nightmare world come in full circle i've never i don't think i've ever done a comic con where i haven't sold a copy of nightmare world but i have 19 other graphic novels out besides nightmare world volume one i have was it 16 other books out besides Nightmare World Omnibus? So this became the de facto brand. This and now there's a figure. They need to write a wrong book.com. But yeah, yeah, be aware of that. And that's something we definitely touch on in this book as well. Is, is a pragmatic, I like what you said, actionable consideration to, to have. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of action. This conversation, if you're enjoying this conversation, if you like some of the jewels and gems that are being dropped on behalf of Dirk, then you're going to want to take action right now and uh, head on over to the right or wrong Kickstarter. Um, You you're you're going to want to get a part of this um, right or wrong, a writer's guide to creating comics, second edition. Let's talk about some of those uh, stretch goals because it's it's funded. Right. So that means that. No, that means that this is a guaranteed book. So yes. now we get to have fun. Yeah, the stretch goal party has begun, right? Now we get exactly. to have fun. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, yeah, so stretch goals. Um, again, I normally run a certain type of campaign. Campaigns I usually run on Kickstarter. I'm very proud of the fact that I'm one of the, the OGs of, of crowdfunding for comics. Right or wrong is not a comic. Right or wrong is a book. You know, it's like, am I going to offer a limited edition hardcover alternate co- cover of it no i'm not <laughs> right not like i do with the comic book so i did something different with this and but i also wanted to definitely bring in a, a love of comics and being a guy that's writing a book talking about comics give people free access to some of my comics so the round one stretch goals we've unlocked the first one already is anybody whose pledge includes a copy of right or wrong is going to get a digital copy of Hope Volume 2, number one, one of my newest books coming out from Source Point Press. Uh, Hope, the first volume, is I think one of the most, it creates one of the, it's created one of the most rabid fan bases of anything I've done. Very popular book. It's very emotionally investing. I know my assignment for Volume 2 is to top Volume 1. Mm-hmm. So I'm giving everyone that backs right or wrong a digital copy of the first issue of Hope Volume 2. And I'm giving them that. And I'm giving them the full script to the first issue. Awesome. So you can literally see, and I I do a little bit of script sample in, in, uh, in right or wrong. There is some limited script sample stuff in here and even like how it looks then, you know, it's for tales of mystery. I do one, but there's the whole thing. So I give you the full comic. I give you the full script so you can see how it was reverse engineered. Then on top of those two things, 
I'm also giving people a special little like commentary about here's how I approach this work, right? I'm a guy that actively says in right or wrong, your first book probably shouldn't be a superhero book Mm. because again, you're going to be swimming really hard upstream on that stuff. But my, I think hope was my six. I gotta go back and look, but it was like, it was late in the game. I had done many other books before I did hope, which is a book about a mom who moonlights a superhero. Um, But I'm going to talk about that. Talk about changing artists from volume one to volume two and just talk about the process of what this looks like and what goes into it. Whereas I talk to you now getting very close to unlocking the second stretch goal, I'm going to do that same process again with the first full issue of The Adventures of Cthulhu Jr. Friends. Love that. I'm a horror guy, but this is my all ages horror book. How do you go about writing an all ages book and what does that look like? So I'm going to give people the full first issue for free. I'm going to give them the full script of the first issue and then a commentary track about what that looks like because Cthulhu Jr. is a co-creator owned book. Scoot McMahon uh, is a co-owner of that book with me. What does that look like? How do you do a co-creator owned book because he's such a part of that book? Um, Then the third stretch goal in round one and big props to Magic Ninja Entertainment and my, my boys in Twisted for doing this. They're letting me give everyone a digital copy of the first issue of Twisted Haunted High Ons. Cool. The full script. And then again, a commentary of what it's like working with Twisted. Twisted is an established band. They're a billboard charting band. They've been around for 20 plus years as well. A lot of people know them as originally like protégés of the Insane Clown Posse. They have an now created their own record label. They have their own other bands they work with. They're doing stuff with like Ice Nine Kills and Cradle of Filth. You know, I mean, they've really evolved very much from their beginnings. And uh, not to bury the lead, Haunted High Ons has been nominated for four Ringo Awards, Incredible. including Best uh, Humor Comic twice. And I'm a guy who writes horror, and the fact that I've been nominated for Best Humor Comic twice. What does that look like? What's the, how, how do you write a, how do you write a humor comic based on real people and laugh with them and not at them? Right. You know, and that's the closest I think I can talk about with a proprietary property. You know, people can hopefully transfer what I talk about if we unlock that stretch goal too. working with a Spider-Man, if you, that's your goal or working for with a Batman or whatever. What does that look like? But furthermore, what's it look like to work with real people? Right. These are guys that have controlled their image and controlled their narrative. Deep wrestling cut for, <laughs> <laughs> See for decades. And then they allowed me to come in and write a comic based on facsimiles of them. So my whole goal with those three round one stretch goals is to one, give people great comic content. And again, I'm going to be real blunt. Maybe people would say, well, you know, Cthulhu Jr., that looks like a kid's book. My hope is that people read it and see, wow, this is really good. Maybe I should have a graphic novel. Or, oh, I know Dirk's horror stuff. Here's a book about a mom who's a superhero. No, you will see why hope is the scariest comic I write. <laughs> or people that maybe say, oh, well, Haunted High On, it's like a juggalo thing. That's not something I'm going to be into. I really don't. I'm not into their music. I promise you. You get a free digital download of that first issue. You'll read it. You will see why that book has been nominated for four Ringo Awards, including Best Illustrator, Best Colorist, and then Best Humor Comic twice. And then read the script if you want. You can compare notes. And then you can just read, should you so choose, about me reflecting on my experience of what it's like working on a book like that. Then the round two stretch goals, we're going to get into some physical stuff after that. We're gonna oh, get some, yeah. Some, some merch. In okay. round two. Okay. And and I wanted to make a, a point about what you what you sort of said about these different books that you get to create and what it's like mm-hmm. to work on all these different things. Um, something that I think a lot of people might not understand is like, hey, well, you get to do all this different stuff. How come you said earlier that Dan Slott became the Spider-Man guy? Well, mm-hmm. um, your goal, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but your goal is to make it so that every time someone has an interaction with you, they're left remembering you. And yes, they walk away and they love the books and they enjoy the, the, the stories that you're telling, but they remember Dirk Manning. And so whether they see your name on a horror book or a comedy book or a superhero book 
or whatever it is, they follow you where you go. And that has created a, a, a career for you that is publisher agnostic <laughs> because you can, you can be your own publisher. It's yeah. platform agnostic because if, you know, if all these platforms go away, you've got a newsletter. So you have created a brand that is so powerful that you don't actually need anything else in order for it to function. And that's what Dirk was talking about before. That's how you get to be able to do all these different things. That's, that's, that's the dream, right? That's the dream. I, I talk in, in Raider on volume one, which again is on the second edition is on Kickstarter right now, RaiderOnBook.com, about how I waited a long time to do a superhero book and that my first several books were all horror because at the end of the day, I identify as a horror writer. I love horror. I love horror movies. I love heavy metal. I love horror comics. That's my jam. You know, but that being said, over the years, and this is part of it, this is part of the equation all of it, people bring their kids to my table. And I'm talking to their kids and stuff, and we're yucking it up. And they like go to grab Nightmare World. And I'm like, oh no, 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 don't read that. I want paper therapy bills later. <laughs> right. You know. And of course, some of those other people are like, oh no, he's been watching like Friday the 13th since he was seven. Like, okay. <laughs> it's on you. I'm just, you know, your choice. But but to me, I do a book like uh, The Adventures of Cthulhu Jr. in France. It's still a Dirk Manning book. And it's so funny because some people were like, I don't know, Scoot's art looks kind of like it's a kid's book and stuff like that. And I said, well, it's not a kid's book. It's all ages. Right. This is a book you can give to anyone. You and I as adults can read Cthulhu Jr. And we will laugh at totally different stuff than a, than a small child. In fact, with Cthulhu Jr. then, I even doubled down. We oh, did these, they did plushies. so cool. Right? My favorite thing with a plushie, big ups to Josh Warner and Lex Lyon. He even has the drool. <laughs> he even has the sorry, sorry, Junior. He even has the drool, right? But you know, seeing kids come by at a Comic Con or at a signing, and they see the book and they see the plushie, make no mistake, Sean, this is an entry level to horror, right? Yeah. This is entry level to horror. Sure. It, it is an all ages book, but it's still about Cthulhu and about the end of the world and stuff like that, right? You know, so. It's nice to be able to have that entry point. Or it's nice when I wrote Nightmare World, I always talked about the umbrella of all the stuff you can do under the umbrella of horror. When I write Hope and people look at this pink book on my table with this strong, you know, woman character, non-sexualized woman character on it, I'm going to be very transparent here with you. I love the fact that young girls or even women of any age walk up to my table and say, I want that. Right. And I start to nudge and tell them what it's about. And like, it's fine. I, I, I want this. You know, I want this book because I, I can see there. I can see they can see themselves in this book. They see what they want to see. They see a non-sexualized female character, which is sometimes hard to find in comic books, you know, um, I love that. And then and then to my horror fans, to your point, I tell them, hope it's the scariest book I write. Not a joke. And they laugh and I'm a laugh. I'm like, no, that pink book, that's the scariest one. What's about a mom who, who's a superhero? Well, yeah. And it's legitimately the scariest book on my table. Right. But ideally, whether you're reading Cthulhu Jr., uh, I, I deal with this all the time with Haunted High on, Sean. It was all the time people like, ah, I wasn't sure about this book. I, I'm really not into juggalo stuff, or I listened to ICP when I was like a teenager and I got away from it. <laughs> you know, but they say, I read this book and I feel like I know Jamie and Paul, mm -hmm. right? And it was funny and it was well illustrated. Any aspiring creator, your goal should be, to your point, to have a book to make yourself your brand. Now, maybe you do that. By having a picture of a little gooby hat and a scarf and stuff like that. But you also do it by putting out quality work consistently. Uh, and 
I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. We've been friends a long time. You, but you mentioned the thing about you know transcending platforms and stuff like that. Someone was busting chops with uh, Travis McIntyre, who was the editor in chief at the time and, and CEO of Sourcebike Press, and they were saying something about you know, uh, you know publishing me and why do you publish Dirk Manning and blah blah blah. You know, just just I'd like to think they were just busting chops, but I'm not sure. Mm. But he goes, he goes, you don't get it. He goes, Dirk Manning doesn't need me. He goes, we make money with Dirk. He goes, Dirk's good. He said, Dirk's going to Dirk. He's going to do what he's going to do. He will publish stuff. And he's shown it. 2003, it was too expensive to print in color. I published online. And then I self-published and print on demand. And then eventually got picked up by a small publisher, then another publisher, then Image Comics. And Nightmare World holds the distinction of being a comic. How do I say this? Nightmare World is a comic that has been published, I think, by more publishers than any other American comic book. Really? It has like it's had like 11 different publishers. Wow. Right? Which is weird. Because that's like saying, like, I was with like 11 different people and they all dumped me, but it wasn't that. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't dump me. I just, I kept moving, right? The book moves. Image Comic quit publishing it. I went to Devil's Do, you know, then took Book and Devil's Do and I went to Source Point Press. Before that, I was, you know, online venues and stuff like that. Sure. But but I like what you said about transcendent. And, and, and to those of you out there that are listening to all this, that want to be creators, back to the goal. And I want to give you the guide to be able to do that right and you do that by being honest with what you want to do putting out the books that only you can put out tell the stories you want to tell to your point earlier do your best to interact with other professionals and and, and anyone in a positive friendly manner you're not going to be perfect you're going to make mistakes own those reflect recalibrate readjust evolve go to therapy cry it out eat some ice cream whatever you got to do move on and keep going and become your own brand. We all get one shot at this. And not to be all metaphysical about this and spiritual about this, but you get one shot at this, you know? And if the earth swallows me tomorrow, well, I'll be mad that I didn't finish Tales of Mystery. <laughs> but, but that aside, I look at the spinner rack over here and it's like, I, made, I, mean, I did it, man. I made books. And people actually supported them and bought them. <laughs> publishers published them. And when publishers didn't want to publish them up front, I published them myself. You know, Incredible. every book there, I hope, is at least one person's favorite. And here's the thing, and this is what I'll say to all of you who are aspiring creators, it's okay for your books to be your own favorite. And if you made a book and it is your favorite, you won. You won. You won the game. You won life. And that's that's what I'm looking to do with right or wrong, is just give people that path. Yeah, we have the action figure you can get, which was kind of, it started as a joke, but it's not. You know, it's limited edition. But at the end, of the, you can add this on too, which is cool. This is the desk Dirk, Sean, right? This is like, <laughs> you put him on your desk, yeah. a little reminder, you get a nice combo, you can get the book and the figure, and you can think, someday I can be this clown shoes right here. <laughs> with <this package. laughs> with a little combo package you can get. You can add some of my other comics in there. There's a Dirk Manning library pledge in there that you can get like five or six of my books, like some stupid, ridiculous cheap price. Because again, I'm not doing this stuff to make money. This is my pay it forward project. I, I just want to help other people have the opportunities that I've had and, and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes that I've made and, 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 and give some guidance because there's not a lot of people out there doing this stuff. There's not a lot of people out there taking the time to write a book to walk you through the process. So that's... Uh, exactly I like that transcendent that was well played my friend well played <laughs> well well played on writing a book that has impacted my life a lot um and i know you know there are a lot of other people who can say the same thing uh right or wrong has been huge for me i've sworn by it i've told other people about it uh it's that it's uh, words, words for pictures by Bendis, yep. and it's on writing by Stephen King. Those are my three go tos. Um, I'm and, like the know. I'm like the meat in that sandwich because on writing <laughs> came out first, then right or wrong came out, and then Bendis did his, which is interesting because Bendis is one of the guys that'll get me on my career. So yeah I'll, yeah, I'll be the meat in that sandwich any day. You know, no problem. 
Absolutely. And, and so, you know, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for making it a priority in your life to help creators uh, on their journey, not just through the book, but even, you know, outside of that conversations that you might have that no one ever knows about, but you and that creator. So um, that's a, that's something that we need more of. And, you know, as you like to say, be kind, um, yeah. and that's a way to be kind. So I want to pledge uh, for right or wrong, a writer's guide to creating comics second edition, because there's new info and I need it. it so I have just backed. I am now the, let's see, does it tell me? Uh, Sean, I'm, you know what you just did, bro? What did you're, I do? You're the hundredth backer. Get out of here. You are number 100. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Can't be number one, but I could be number 100. No, man, look, man, that's, we just hit triple digits because of you, which is amazing. You know, I, I will say this before we, we wrap up here. One thing I realized by doing a Kickstarter is everything's out there. It's transparent, right? There's people that inflate their numbers and stuff like that. I can't inflate it. If right. I sell two copies, you're going to see it. Thanks to you, my friend, we have hit triple digits and we are less than $200 away from the second stretch goal right now. Awesome. So thank you, man. I, I appreciate you and thank you. And to those of you out there that if you've listened this long, goodness gracious, I hope you'll consider investing. And that's it, free US shipping on the books too. Okay. Oh, love that. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, shipping's getting more and more expensive, but as long as your as long as your pledge level includes right or wrong, if you're in the continental United States, you're getting shipped to you for free. Right or wrongbook.com. Um, free US shipping, which just sees what you pay. Uh but yeah, man, you're number 100. You've kept it 100, my friend. That's a beautiful you thing. You made it 100. I love, I love that. And I love, one of the things I love to do is to put my money where my mouth is. And this is a book that I stand by. This is a book that I enjoyed and loved. And I think that if you are a person who wants to be a creative professional, whether it's in comics or otherwise, if you're a person who's curious about a guy who writes comics with you know the most horror horrific things you've ever seen on 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 page and a guy who also writes stories for all ages if you're curious about that man this is the book that you need writerwrongbook.com dirk manning thank you so much before we close how can people find you and continue to learn about you and what you do uh dirkmanning.com is my website i'm on pretty much all reputable social media uh, and some maybe not as reputable these days <laughs> at Dirk Manning. Look for the picture that you got the top hat and the scarf. And that's me. Um, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to be doing some stuff on that soon as well. Um, but there's lots of interviews up there, including years worth of interviews with uh, the, the comics pals, pre comics Ooh. pals stuff as well with Sean yeah. here. So if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, you can look at that, but uh, Instagram, Facebook, God help me, even Twitter, uh, all at <laughs> Dirk Manning. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's where I can be found. And, and DirkManning.com has my touring schedule. I tour pretty aggressively. Um, I'm trying to cut down to about 20 shows a year, which is still about a show most every other weekend when you play it out that way. Yeah. I know. I, I'm trying to cut down to 20, oh you know. <laughs> um, but information's there. You can sign up for my newsletter. I send out a newsletter once a month uh, just directly from my email. All killer, no filler. I know there's Substack and stuff out there. I haven't taken the plunge on that yet because... I usually like the right people email once a month. I'll let you know what's going on. You can sign up for that drugman.com. And uh, Sean, seriously, man, thank you. Triple digits. Absolutely. The book went to triple digits. So thank you. Beautiful thing. A project we love. Now triple digits. You're number 100. That is, uh, that is incredible. And, and to those of you that want to make comics, I'm going to say it one last time. Invest in yourself. My goal is that if you spend 25 bucks, have this book shipped to your door. It's going to make a positive impact on your life. And, and that's all I want to do here. And if you know someone else creative, music, art, comics, whatever, maybe give them a copy, help them out. You know, I mean, that, that, that's the name of the game. We're not, we're not looking to make a million dollars on this book and, and stuff in my pocket. This is a book I spent years on to pay for it all of you and uh, help out. Absolutely. Dirk, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you. Anytime you get to do this is a great time in my book. So yeah. thank you so much, my friend. Thank you for listening. 
Until next time, take care, guys. Thanks.